All right, today we're gonna put together a little workshop for you guys. Um, we're not here to teach you how to intubate. We're just here to, you know, you guys know how to intubate. We're here to kind of give you some tips and tricks we've used over the years to help with very difficult intubation situations, all right? First and foremost though, before we get into the intubation part itself, let's go over the bag. And I know that this is old hat for a lot of you guys, but it's always good as a review. When we talk about the BVM, you know, there's an anesthesiologist out there who has quoted yeah, I can teach you how to bag in five minutes, but it'll take you five years to master. And I truly believe that um, when we get into how to properly bag again as a review. To start off before we even start squeezing the bag, let's talk about how to place it on the patient. And I know that sounds silly, but this is what we all do. We pull it out of the bag, we open it up, we plug it into oxygen, and then we assemble it away from the patient. This is a mistake if you have more people on scene. I believe that if at any, if at all possible, please do two-person VVM versus single-person VVM. It's not a little bit better, it's a lot of it better. And what I mean is, single-person, you, ex you, you assemble it away from the patient, you place it on patient, you do the EC that we've always been taught, and then you go to town. Now granted, if you grab it closer to the connector piece in the center, you will get better downwards pressure and a better seal. But if you understand that the effectiveness of this piece of equipment is solely based on how good of a seal you get, then you need that two-person BVM going on. So what I would recommend is take it out of the bag, place the bag down and hook it up to oxygen. Take the mask, open it up, place it at the bridge of the nose and wrap it all the way around to where you need it. Then go ahead and get a good seal. Now before we have the person who I would be considered the most experienced and versed in bagging itself to do the squeezing, let me show you how to position the patient for the best seal. You might have a little bit of difficulty if they have a beard, if they have loss of facial structure or bony structure from trauma or no dentures. Age can also deteriorate some of the tissue, causing a problem with the seal. But how do we get the best airflow down into the trachea? Well, we've always been taught head tilt, chin lift if no spinal injury is suspected, or you have a jaw thrust. The problem I have with that is don't pick and choose. If they have no spinal injury, do both. And the reason that's important is this is a person who will not accept an OPA, but they're not the easiest to bag in the world. So I need the tongue off the airway and the most open space I can deliver the air. How do we do that? Especially with the mask. Take your ring and pinky finger on either side and place it back on the TMJ. And then I want you to go ahead and press up, hold the mask, and then take your index fingers and open the chin, then do a head tilt chin lift because we've all done this, especially on a kitchen counter, or a kitchen floor, if I do a head tilt chin lift, what inevitably helps, um, happens 99% of the time, the head flattens back out. I can't hold it up without putting undue pressure underneath the chin. Whereas with two person BVM, I've got full control of the head and I can do this. And when we go back to the jaw thrust, we've always been taught to do this. Well, it looks like you're actually closing the mouth, the teeth closer together, but the jaw's protruding. That's good, but I need to get that jaw open so I can get more air down into the trachea, okay? And then the second person will go ahead over the top of this and they will go ahead and start bagging. Path of least resistance is the trachea itself because it's being held open with, with the cricoid rings, with the cartilage rings. Whereas the esophagus is a smooth muscle that lays flat on itself. And the only way I can get air down into the stomach is I have to mean it. And there's a few different ways that we do that. Number one, I put too much pressure, too much volume in. So the chest is an enclosed box and there's tissue, there's blood, there's vessels and there's air in that cardiac, in that chest cavity. If the pressure builds too great, it's got to come back somewhere. It's either going to come top side because I don't have a good enough seal or it's going to come up here and then go back down into the stomach. The second way I fill up the stomach, and I'm telling you, you can bag for a good 45 minutes and not have to decompress the stomach if you keep these in mind. The other way to do it is the forcefulness of each bag. Okay, if I do a nice squeeze and then let it release, then that air, 99% of it's going into the lungs. But if I, if I squeeze it hard and aggressively, and guys, nobody breathes like this, so why are we doing this to patients? But that excess pressure in the hypopharynx is gonna blow down into the tray or into the stomach, and it's gonna fill it up. The, uh, the third way that we have to be careful about not putting air into the belly is asynchronous ventilations, which means nothing more than, for example, I have an overdose patient who's breathing six times a minute, okay? Once every 10 seconds, 
and I gotta breathe, I gotta help him breathe. But as he's trying to exhale his own air, I'm trying to put more in. The two fight in the middle, goes down into the belly, so I have to kind of assist my patient with giving additional breaths in between their own breaths, all right? Take that in consideration when we're talking about, you know, not wanting to fill up the belly. Uh, talk about too much volume, all right? And, and again, we've, we've all been told this, but if I squeeze too hard, too much, okay, this is a liter bag, and to fill up an average adult's chest is only about four to 600 mLs, and 600's pushing it for a really big guy, because we're talking five to seven mLs per kilo. So all I need to do is really just give a half a squeeze, Okay, not a full squeeze. I don't want to have to feel my fingers on either side of the bag. And I just need to see chest rise. Now talk about chest rise real quick. We've always been said, we've always taught with kids, you, if you want to see retractions or adequate chest rise, you have to remove the shirt. Well, I'll tell you that if, it's, if, if they're wearing something a little bit more than a t-shirt, you need to kind of assess the chest by actually looking at it. Because if you just happen to walk into a room, you can't tell me how fast anyone's breathing unless the effort is accentuated. You don't know when the chest really moves if they're wearing a thicker shirt or anything like that. So really you have to look. And once the lungs are inflated, they're almost all the way inflated before the chest wall even is visibly seen moving because they have very limited potential space. But once the, once the lungs are fully inflated, then the chest wall expands. And understand that if they don't have any muscular movement with it because they're unresponsive, the chest wall is only moving because of the diaphragm and the lungs being able to be fully expanded. So don't puff it out like Superman. As soon as you see the chest move, that's enough. Okay. The other problem is what? Well, it, again, this is an enclosed box. Something has to give if the, if the air becomes too pressurized. And that means eventually tissue will give because you'll have weakened spots in the lungs called blebs and you just think about like a weakened spot on the inner tube of a bicycle tire that'll eventually blow. And that's what we always think about, but understand that takes a while to happen, even for the sicker people. What happens immediately and with each breath is the blood flow, the blood return to the heart is, is it's kind of blocked off, you know, because understand if this is overpressurized, What's gonna give first? Well, the blood vessels are gonna have a lot of pressure against them, and it's inhibiting the amount of blood flow that can return to the heart, and therefore hurting the ejection fraction that you're gonna get. And what does all that mean in English? My blood pressure is gonna to continue to drop. This is no more important than during an arrest, and CPR is going on, and two minutes of compressions are happening, I've got a tube of some sort, of an airway of some sort, and I'm bagging too much, any bit of compressions and perfusion that we're trying to achieve during circulation of CPR, which at best, the very best, best compressions you could do, man or machine made, is giving you about the ejection fraction of an incredibly sick CHF heart when the patient's probably on you know, a heart transplant list. So you're working against everything. Now take in the fact that I'm over inflating lungs, so I'm taking all the work that this guy's sweating over and I'm taking it away from him. So I really have to be careful, especially during an arrest when I do that. Move on to rate, all right? We talked about volume a little bit, talk about rate. Remember that the danger of hyperventilation and the actual cadence that I'm used to hearing on scene is probably once every three seconds. Because we feel that we have to bag quicker to deliver more oxygen. But let me introduce you to a concept. If you have an, a patient who's having an anxiety attack and she's breathing or he's breathing 40, 50 times a minute, are they able to draw in any more than 21% oxygen from the air? No, of course not. So why is it that we feel that the faster we squeeze this, the more oxygen they're, they're receiving? I want you to think of oxygen as a drug. And the only way I can increase the dose of that drug is to turn it up on the wall, turn it up on the tank. That's the dose. This is simply a delivery device. The air in here is a delivery device to allow the drug to be given. Now, yes, you need a mechanical squeeze to open up all the alveolar, alveolar beds so it can have better gas exchange, but it has zero to do with rate of how much oxygen that they get. Case in point, if you think of a BVM, please think of a nasal cannula. And this is kind of a concept that's within the past couple of years that we've been trying to push. But the idea is, and people are gonna look at you weird if they've never heard this before, but if you have a nasal cannula and you're blowing it at 15 liters a minute and I place it on here, 
whether the patient's actually breathing or not, you will actually achieve up to three of peak, and it can buy you up to a minute and a half, 90 seconds of actual uh, maintaining your sats before they start to drop. So if I remove the BVM, and this is still blowing at 15 liters, and I pull this piece of equipment out and go in, this is gonna buy me time. Now granted, you know, you have to take, there's a little caveat to that, you know, it depends on age, it depends on comorbidities, it depends on weight, believe it or not, uh, and it depends on what kind of metabolism they've got going on right now as to how quick they're gonna burn this oxygen off. But just by it passively, passive insufflation, as soon as it's just passively going into the lungs, what it's doing is it's gonna replace all the nitrogen that's not useful for us, and it's gonna replace it with oxygen, so you're still getting some gas exchange occurring. Okay, so back to rate. What's the danger of hyperventilation? Well, what happens? My CO2 drops too low. If it drops too low, what happens? Go back to the anxiety patient. He, she's breathing 30, 40, 50 times a minute. How long do you think they can keep that up before they do what? They pass out. Why do they pass out? Because physiologically what's happening in your brain, specifically in the blood vessels in your brain, is if the CO2 drops too low, they pinch off. They get so tight that the oxygen isn't been able to receive by the brain. Now intuitively, I feel like I'm giving them good oxygen, but you know what? The finger says 100% or 99%. I don't want that. I want the brain to get it, not necessarily the finger. So we get deceived by looking at the sat and we forget that the brain's not receiving it because I'm bagging too quickly. How fast do I bag? Well, if you don't have CO2 hooked up to them, can you have CO2, a, a CO2 nasal cannula with this? Absolutely. But if, if I'm bagging over it, is it gonna be a tainted sample or is the CO2 gonna be altered? Very, very possibly. You know, how do I know what my true CO2 is? Well, if they're breathing on their own, you can remove the bag for a second or two. Remember, pre-oxygen does, uh, pre-oxygenation doesn't mean this, okay? It just simply means putting on oxygen that's greater than room air. And that's all we're talking about, okay? But how do I know how fast to bag? Well, if I don't have CO2 hooked up and I can't measure it yet, because I don't have an airway device or they're not breathing well enough to a nasal cannula uh, sensor to pick it up, how do I know? Bag once every six seconds, eight seconds, you know, just not too bad, not too much, not too, not too fast. Once I have a CO2 uh, uh, measurable in place, how fast do I bag? Well, you bag to a rate of 35 to 45. You know, this is just a couple of little variations as to why you would defer from that. But for the most part, I know how quick to bag. As a matter of fact, if you're smart about it, you won't even know how fast you're bagging. Someone else should count it for you because all you're trying to do is match up what it is. And it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. It can be a balancing act for a little bit because I don't know how fast I need to bag. I'm just trying to get that. And you can, you can adjust it within four to six breaths. And then once you get the right cadence to maintain 35 to 45, keep it. Yeah. The other thing I'll tell you about airway before we move on to intubation is, is probably one of the most important concepts and, and things that we need to discuss when we're talking about BLS airway management, which is everything. Historically speaking, most of the time when we're in the back looking, assisting, helping with really sick or hurt people, the person who's given this job <coughs> pays the least attention to it. What do I mean by that? I'm in the captain's chair, I'm bagging the patient, but because this person's trying to get an IO, this one's getting an IV, this one's trying to hook up to this, this one's checking pockets for any information, this one's trying to control some bleeding, this one's trying to get this and that and the other. You know what the person at the head's doing? He's doing this. He's watching everyone else. He's not focusing on what his job is. You have the most important job of the call if you're at the head, if you're at the airway. If you have that job, pay attention to what you're doing. Because that's how you, you could know not to bag too hard. You could know not to bag too fast. But I promise if you focus on what you're doing and you're watching the sat and you're watching the CO2 and you're mining the cadence and the squeeze of how you're bagging, and then somebody grabs your attention, it's like muscle memory. And it's the worst for some of the older, older ones because we've just used to doing this. And you'll, your hand will get a mind of its own and it'll just start going to town on this bag and you'll have to catch yourself. So please, 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 don't worry about whether they're getting an IV. Don't worry about anything else but what your world is right here. EMT and medical life, all right? Now let's move on 
to actually achieving an, uh, an advanced airway. Stop.